Uh, welcome to the Royal Automobile Club on Pall Mall. We're here in the uh, Seagrave room. I'm Jack Phillips, edit, digital editor of Motorsport, and I'm with Joe Don, editor of Motorsport, and uh, Derek Bell. This is a, a regular on the talk show. Here. <laughs> yes, we've done it a few times, yes. haven't we? Um, uh, today we're going to talk about mainly Porsche, obviously, for good reason, because you've got your, your, new, your new tome. About That's right, can you see that? All right? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you made Richard uh, Hesenthal work quite hard. Yeah, he actually he worked very hard without me pushing him at all. I didn't know what it was really going to be like, and it was all their idea, you know. Um, Philip Porter and, and Richard was dragged into it. And um, I think two-thirds of the way through, he's going, I don't know how many, <laughs> this is a lot to do. And when he said there's 202 races, I went, oh, my Lord. He said, I'm not sure that, you know, you, you know that have you, can you remember them all? And I said, no, I don't know. Anyway, by the time we got through it, and then I got the sort of the the roughs coming through, I can, okay, I can remember that. Well, I mean, I did not remember them, but I was much better at remembering the victories than I was the ones where we didn't finish, which weren't too many, because you don't often break down in a Porsche, which is rather nice. No, un unless you're at Sebring, I think. Pardon? Unless you're at Sebring. Unless you're at Sebring, yeah, but I, yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, God, you, you've read it. <laughs> it's very good, it is, as well. Yeah. Pardon? Sorry. It's very good. Is it? I, well, yeah. I, I think it looks good, and I scanned it, and obviously, I mean, I scanned it, I've scanned through it, the other night with all the people around, and then the other night, last night, and it's actually it is good, yeah. And I think the way they put it together, compiled it all, and presented it is fa is fabulous. Yeah. How, how did you how did Richard go about doing it with you? Did you did you come over to your house and yes, sit he, down? And he said I'm going to be there for two days. He said I'm going to be with you. Put a tent in the back garden. Yeah. No, I thought I was going to have to. We did it, and we did it all in sort of three quarters of a day. Right. Because um, I get on with it all quite quickly, and I remember things, and he, and. And of course, y the great thing, having worked with him on another magazine, as you well know, um, he does have a lot of stuff that I told him about over the years. So, and of course, I guess he had seen the previous book. So he, 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 f he dropped into it so easily. I mean, he couldn't believe it. He got actually through it in one sort of from 10 in the morning till five at night and it was all dealt with. <laughs> but that wasn't, I mean, everything, and we hadn't got all the photographs, but we went through all the races and more and more and more races. <laughs> There were some obs uh, obscure races as well. Yeah, there were some obscure ones, so, you know, which sort of crop. You go, know, really? Yes, you're right. I mean, uh, there's some pictures in there, and I was going to, and I went, I don't remember <laughs> driving that one with Mexicillo on the side, Me what, with Mecarillos or something, the one with stripes on, Porsche, obviously. I, didn't, I couldn't tell you where I raced it. I mean, but there weren't many like that, because as fortunately, so much, the major stuff was Rothmans and Lohenbrau. Yep. And, of course, the Gulf and the 917s and stuff, but... Uh, the, the, my major career was Rothmans and, and dovetailing in with Lohenbrow in America. Yeah. And we, there were the races that obviously were the bigger ones and the ones that we were more successful in, I, I yeah. suppose. And it all started at Goodwood. Yeah, well, it, yes, with Porsche, you mean. Yeah. Strange, you know, it is astonishing, isn't it? And that they, they actually brought, uh, they brought the car to Goodwood for me to do a test uh, with Ronnie Peterson and Peter Gethin in, I think, sep something like September 1970. Yep. Am I right? I think you so. You might tell me it's the next month, but I mean, I'm not good at months, but I know it had to be that year. And, <coughs> and, and I, I, what I'd, I was talking to somebody in the last few days, because so many people have come out of the woodwork in the last week with a book coming out that, you know, came along with programs from different races. Last night, a Jack came along with the two programs, one from my very first race in 1964, and he said they got the date wrong. It was Saturday the 13th, not the 14th. Oh, sorry. Anyway, and so... and. Uh, <coughs> And which I won, you know, in the rain that day. And I went down the entry list. I couldn't believe who was in the race that carried on and raced, you know, through the Lotus 7 Championship and not into Formula 3. And then from that, he then had the next program. The only other one he had was, was of June 19, uh, actually later on than June. It was the, la one, it was the last penultimate race meeting at Goodwood right. in 66. And I was in Formula 3, and there I was winning the race. And I went through the list of all the people that were in the race. Again, it was phenomenal, just who was in it, yeah. that I didn't know, but of course went on to be you know, professional drivers. And, yeah. and it was just fantastic to see this stuff. So I actually got a copy last night, took it away with wow. me afterwards. So I had it as a record. But g going away from that, so it was strange that you know, I should be, uh, drive the 917 at Goodwood, my home racetrack, which I sort of used to fantasize around on the farm as I was hoeing the sugar beet, and sort of had this dream about one day driving at Goodwood, never knowing that I would ever race there, and then to drive in a Porsche 917, which of course at, that t at those days, and nobody had heard of a 917 10 years earlier. 
But, I mean, it was fantastic. Uh, the only disappointing thing, we don't have any photographs of right. that test, which seems unusual. And all, but, but then PR didn't matter in those days. And then, of course, on, uh, on top of that, we, um, we, we didn't have any lap times. So I have no idea what lap times I did. Right. And when I actually mentioned it to John Horsman, um, he said he didn't, and, and then the book he did called Racing in the Rain, there's nothing about the Goodwood test. Oh, really? And it was part of their, their history. And he's coming over to England in the next few weeks because they're featuring him at and John Wire at Le Mans this year. They're doing a tribute to the John Wire era, which John Horseman was a major part of it. And so I'm going to have to really push him about yeah. it and say, you know, wh why did you choose me? I think the, the probably the reason was is that, that well, the story I heard was um, Ronnie Peterson was more interested in getting into Formula One, which I could understand because he was what, five years younger than me and Peter, and Peter was more interested in going out with the girls. And John Wire much preferred me <laughs> because I didn't do either of those things. So, well, I did, but not that bad. <laughs> not, it wouldn't let it affect my racing. And that was the story that came out of it. Did but you remember much from the day? Or? Uh, nothing, no. I don't remember how many laps we did, but we must have done, I should think we must have done 10 laps each. Right. And I, I'd love to know the times, because, I mean, we were young, trying to prove ourselves in a really good cracking current car and uh, you know on that t that place you know uh, McLaren used to test their Can-Am cars so and Formula One cars used to test there so for us we, it would have been representative of yes. some good times because I mean you may um, you wouldn't remember but you might or might know about it but they they often used to say to us in 71 can you have a go can you think do you think you can break the Formula One lap record right and we were very close to it I mean we were, I think we were quicker around Spa than Formula 1. I did 160 mile an hour lap in qualifying there, which I don't think the Formula 1s went that quick. No, um, because Peterson would have been quite close to Formula 1 by that point. Geffen he was yes, yes he was on the edge. Of, he was right on the edge of it, wasn't he? But his great race was like 71 or 2, when 73, something when he drove the BRM and won at Monza. Yes. And so they would have been that. But you know, we'd all been through the ringer by then. I mean, when we did this, we were, we were sort of... Uh, I just finished sixth in the United States Grand Prix, finished second in the Formula 2 championship. And I had my first race at Spa in a Ferrari and had my first Le Mans of my life for Ferrari as well. So, you know, there's a lot of activity going on in our lives, Peter, well, me and also Ronnie. Were you still dreaming of Formula 1 at this stage? Were oh, you yeah. Still, it was still very much single yeah. stint, right? We all wanted to do that. Mm. I mean, it, now these days, the, uh, the guys don't get up into Formula 1 because they don't get the brakes, but the reason is, is people aren't getting injured all the time. And, um, you know, I mean, when we were out there in Formula 1, I remember we tried to qualify at Brands Hatch in like 73 or 4, I remember in the 30s, and there were 36, I think 36 on the grid, Formula 1 cars, or 32, and I, call it, I remember a crash trying to, to go <laughs> get a quicker time to get on the grid. I remember Jochen, Jochen Mass saying to me, God, it's terrible when you actually are trying to qualify for a Grand Prix, not just, you know, sort of do well in a race, but to actually get yeah. on the grid. And sh it shows how bad the car was at the time or how poor we were. But the beginning of the year, that year actually, I'm not rubbishing the 30s because it was actually a fabulous car when I drove it previously. But I mean, Jochen and, and Carlos Pacho on the front row of the grid in Kyle Army with, that, with those cars. And by the time we got to the British Grand Prix, we, neither of us were qualifying. Wow. And Pacho had left and gone elsewhere. But you know, that's the way it was in racing. You know, all the teams improve and budgets and that sort of thing. And I think John, I know we're meandering off, but I think John was getting low on budgets and sponsors and things and it reflected in our engines and that sort of thing. Yeah. So what do you remember of the 512, uh, the, the Ferrari, especially compared to the 917? Yes. Well, uh, it was nothing. I mean, the Ferrari was obviously for me, it was a wonderful opportunity when Jack Swatters of Brussels offered me the drive. He had met me during my Formula One time. And he was one of Ferrari's main contributors financially, I yeah. think, as was um, Marinello here, to keep the old team going. And um, so when Jack, who I, I say, gave me my drive at Spa and then Kyle Army, and then I did the whole of the Steve McQueen movie in his car, actually, although it was painted red for the, race, for the film. But, um, you know, Jacques was a m major part of me being at Ferrari in sports cars, because if he hadn't offered me that drive at Spa, I'm sure Mr. Ferrari wouldn't have said, I, I want him in my team, because I would, hadn't proved myself. And the sickening thing, in a way, was that I just left Ferrari from Formula One and Two at the end of sixty, um, sorry, sixty-nine. I, but I left mid-year really because they, they weren't racing. So they said, "Well, lad, you're a lot free. Off you go." And I drove for McLaren at the British Grand Prix, for example, and other stuff. 
But if I'd still been with Ferrari, I'd have naturally gone straight into the sports car program, which I had no idea they were, a set, they were building. And I suppose by the time I was there in June, the last time, or June, early July, then they developed the Ferrari sports car, unknown to me, and of course bring it out. But it was, I mean, for me, it was obviously a mammoth car, because the only thing I'd ever driven was a yeah. nine seven, it was a, a Lotus 7. So <laughs> to drive this car was pretty, and it was the most powerful car I'd ever driven in my life. And, but in go to Spa as well for your first time, I don't know quite how they, why they asked me to go to Spa. <laughs> but I, you know, it's a very challenging track, but the old tracks were like that. So you never thought, oh my goodness, this is dangerous. You just said, I've really got to give it some here. And it was such a challenge. But the Ferrari itself was, was sort of, I always thought it was, a, it was a heavy car and it didn't have any, you had very little sensitivity through that chassis as it was. I mean, it improved in the latter, yeah. later cars I've driven since then, they, they, s they did something to give them more feel. But you know, you come into corners, and you, go, you go to turn the wheel, turn in the corner, it, would, it wouldn't respond, and then suddenly it would respond, and you it didn't oversteer anything, it would just suddenly bite and go. But there was a bit of a delay there. With the 917, it, it, there was, it was softer, which we all knew it ran soft because of the chassis was fairly soft. So immediately you sort of turned in, they got a reaction from the 917, so you got going quicker. I think I remember you saying before that it's the Ferrari was stronger but the Porsche was far, far quicker. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting that uh, you can feel that the Ferrari was that much tougher. Yes. Was that stronger yeah, well, I, d I didn't have much experience, but I had driven Formula One cars. Mm. And, and so I knew about stiffness and how a car feel. The whole thing is that feel, you know, I mean, sensitivity and how you react to what the car does, because it sends you a message. If it doesn't move, you, when's this going to happen? And then, you know, it would t start to turn. But then you get to know that's its characteristic. So you drive within that. And you know that when you come up to whatever you call it, you're down to Stavlo, you know when you're turning in there that it's not going to respond initially, but you just turn it because you know it is going to work. Yep. And then it starts to work and you go out. The and so you, you're doing it sooner and sooner to get the power on sooner to get out of the corner quicker. Almost like driving a turbo. That's yes. right, exactly. Yeah, very much so. But not many people experience that. No. Did you feel a lot of the 917 drivers will, they'll get to the end of the Mulsanne and they're basically driving with their fingertips because the car's all over the place? I didn't have that. Either. The car was well sorted. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I was very, very fortunate that I, dr I drove the, the Fine Ike car, the 1971 car, which by an unbeknown to me until three months ago, um, I didn't realise Norbert Singer hadn't joined the team until the beginning of that year or during the end of the previous year. Right. And that car initially came out in 69. And when I drove that car recently at, Val at Valencia, and that was another experience, which I'll tell you, about, but you don't need to hear about that necessarily. But I mean, by the time I got in it, I mean, the long tail with what Norbert's you know, input and whatever else had happened with the chassis and the bits and pieces, it was fantastic. And I mean, uh, my first drive was in the 917 at Goodwood. And then from there, we went, uh, then I got the magic call, having been accepted by John Wire later that day, or whenever, I got a call from Porsche, would I go to Hockenheim in December and test there and do some aerodynamic tests? Well, it was the long tail, it was at Hockenheim, which of course didn't have those funny chicanes in, yep. the, the Clark chicane and the Senna chicane. But I mean, it, still, it was bloody quick, but you still had corners on it and also the stadium. And we went, but we didn't use all the corners in the stadium, we just made the straight longer and I came right the way into the stadium and picked up the sort of a penultimate corner, went along the pit straight, turned right and went out. Yep. Um, but I was in a long tail and it was piddling with rain. I didn't get in, they were filming all morning and I got in at uh, like at one o'clock in the afternoon on like December the 16th. And it was, I mean, it was foggy, it was raining and it was cold. And, uh, they, uh, and I was supposed to be doing aerodynamic tests. I didn't see I can do aerodynamic tests in the rain, but you don't argue with them because you think they, they do know what they're doing. And I mean, I was sliding this thing around and having it, a, you know, well-controlled drive in it. I didn't for one minute strike me the car was dangerous, dodgy, or unpleasant. Um, and I didn't even really know that it had been because I'm too stupid to read motorsport and <laughs> find out what was written about the race because they didn't interest me. I was only interested in single-seaters right. until suddenly I find myself with my bum in a 917. And, um, you know, when you actually look at it, you realize that, you know, that long tail was really a bloody good car because then we took it to Le Mans and we were doing 246 miles an hour with it. And it was as stable as a rock. I mean, we took the kink flat. Not your first lap, but after, I'm sure after just a few laps. 
Is that, uh, is that still a record, 246 miles an hour? No, well they did, somebody did 250 in that um, French machine that they built just to do it, but then they only did an hour of the race and yes. retired, so, which was unfortunate. I mean, other teams claim they went quick. They, no, they didn't go quicker. Di uh, oh, Vic says sometimes <laughs> he, he, he did two two plus 246, but as far <laughs> as I know, he didn't. All I know is that John Horsman, no, Norbert Singer said to me as we walked across the paddock at the end of the test day or the two test days at uh, the finish, he said, so how many revs are you pulling on the Mulsanne straight? And uh, I said, the maximum I saw with the different body configurations, although the front really stayed the same because it's welded on, as you yeah. know. So it's generally the rear. And I said, the most I saw was 8,100 revs, Norbert. So he said, ah, oh, that is good because at 8.2 she blows up. And that's when I, I've told that story <laughs> so many times, but it's totally true. And, um, and I thought, blimey, you know, the, P the Porsche are pretty close on everything they do. They, whereas dear old Ferrari say, no, when the re valves bounce, shift gear, you know, that sort of situation. Different sort of te p character, totally. And then he started, and then we're walking around, and he gets his slide rule out, and I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm calculating your top speed. So la, 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 la. And he said, allowing for tire growth, and he started to laugh. I said, well, what is it? He said, no, it's better you don't, it better you don't <laughs> know, you know? And I went, well, I, if we're gonna do a drive this thing for 24 hours, I think we should know. So he said, allowing for tire growth, that's 396 kilometers an hour. And Norbert was never in the habit of telling lies. No. So that's 246. So whether you like it or not, it was pretty quick and nobody else shouted, they went quicker. No. And there was another story of you at Le Mans with Norbert Singer and a man on a bicycle. Oh, God. No, it wasn't Le Mans. That was Hockenheim. That was Hockenheim, that yeah. was the same day. That was the same day as when I drove in the wet, yes, right. in the pouring rain, my first time in the long tail. And it was right, <laughs> I'd said it was wet and foggy and damn cold. And it was really, I mean, you could hardly see. And, um, and all this fog was coming down in the trees. And so they went out and where I, I we, you know, it was really up to date technical stuff this was, but as we, on the two straights, like, coming b out of the stadium, going back into the stadium, which is around that kink, now the, now the center kink. As you came down there, they wanted to know how many revs you were pulling. Well, it was difficult for me to really tell when I was blinding rain, or no, very rainy, uh, bad for conditions, and it was not exact, you know. So they had a, like a big box on the seat over there, or on the floor, which was a form of computer. But I had to switch it on, so I'm going down the straight, and as I passed this, this sort of light, flashing light, I had to press a button. And then as I passed the next one, I pressed it again. So they got that air. I mean, it, it wasn't actually when I pressed it that mattered, it was the fact that I pressed it for the period that it went through the beams. And uh, they didn't want to raise paper, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so and, and that's, that's how they sort of, so I was doing that in the rain. And it came to the end of the day. Initially, it hadn't been that dark, but then the last few laps, and of course, everybody was saying, we need just there's a little bit more to go here, with a little bit more to go. And so I literally, w well, it ended up being my last run, but it was right on the, on the, the, the ring of five o'clock, which really w was, it was getting December. Quite, quite, it's December, enough said. And I came down through the east curve and came out, and I was really honking on. I was just bearing left to go around the kink. <laughs> and I mean, whatever speed, I mean, I was doing 175, and I have no idea what I was, but it was moving on. And, um, and just as I started to go through the kink, suddenly I suddenly saw this poor bar. On a, on a push bike and you see, oh, I saw his eyes going, oh gosh. And he was peddling like fury <laughs> to get out the way. I mean, he did, it was brilliant. Obviously, uh, he's, I mean, when I, time I saw him, I guess I picked him up there and just that last pedal made him move. But I remember vividly seeing his face and his, wa his eyes going, I come this way every damn day. <laughs> and today I nearly got killed. I can imagine telling the missus when he got back to the house over his <laughs> cup of tea, like, you know. But um, yeah, it was close. But. Um, and uh, that's not the only person that you appeared in the middle of the track. I remember there's someone else when you, with, you mentioned Steve McQueen earlier, but oh when gosh. you were filming and you were... Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that was crazy. I told that story actually last night as well. Um, people said, what was it like to work with Steve McQueen? And we, we worked together, all of us worked with him for three months and he was an amazing character. And he, he loved cars. I'll say that before we get into that scene. But he loved cars. He wanted to race Le Mans. He wanted to race. He wasn't interested really in the film at all. All he wanted to do was have fun driving Porsches yeah. at very high speed. I mean, he, to my knowledge, he never drove the Ferrari. He might have done, but he never did the d when I was there that I'm a w I can remember. And um, 
but he just loved being with us. And if, you know, if he walked in here now, he would come up and sit with us because you're journalists and uh, I'm a racing driver and we can just talk. And he would sit there and just chat. Yeah. And he wanted to be part of the team. He wasn't trying to be Steve McQueen. He wasn't trying to be an actor. The acting was nothing. I mean, that he was just himself. And he always said that to us. He said, you know, he said, no, I'm just myself. Whenever you hear me talk, that's how I talk. And it was. That's why there wasn't much dialogue. I mean, most of it was just Steve looking, you know. And, and presumably you, tr- sorry to interrupt, but you, you treated him just as a, as a just driver as, as a well. driver, yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously, initially it was like, this is Steve McQueen. You yeah. know, make the bullet <laughs> and the great escape and all this stuff. And we, uh, we were a bit in awe. But he was so relaxed and spent time with us. And he wasn't, well, he didn't want to spend time with the other actors, although not many of them were really. There weren't many actors. There weren't many actors <laughs> in it as such. And of course, as the movie went on, John Sturdy said, I wish to goodness I'd used you drivers as actors because there was no dialogue, you know, so we could have just done the bit. I mean, Steve, half the ta- more than half the time, he was asking us what we would do in this situation. So we would walk through and show him how we'd get in the car. And then the actor would go, I like that, I do that. You know. You just do that, you know. And you can see John Sturdy's going, oh, Lord, <laughs> <laughs> what have we got actors for? And just, you know, he, even that thing with Winston, we'll come back to your story, but even with the two fingers that Steve Ray, that he did, he came to me one, and it might have been more than me, but I remember I'm the one that said it, and I'm not, it doesn't really matter whether I did or not, but, and he, he came and he said, if I wanted to make an impression on another driver up there, you know, like the guy that I'm competing against, how would I signal that, you know, in a, in a and I said, well, it's a, it's a sort of thing that we do in England. You can't really put a name on what it is. And if you, if you raise your finger to somebody, it can mean, like, thanks, you know, whatever you, because you, you know, carved me up on the racetrack or, or, or on the road and you're really upset about something. But it, it can be almost a sort of a, you know, see you out there sort of, you know, or it, it, it's a, it wasn't a thing of in, endearment, but it was something that was like a, a communication with somebody without appearing rude. Uh, but it meant that you acknowledged them. And that, so he went and did it, you know, and it was quite funny, really. Uh, it seemed odd because so many people said, what the hell was that? Uh, and only Steve was the only one in the whole film that knew what it was, <laughs> and a few British people, <laughs> actors, because I don't think it was used anywhere else in the world, you know. But it wasn't like, you know, the American one of raising one finger at somebody, which is pretty, you know, pretty bad. This yeah. was not a bad thing to do, in my opinion. And I lived on the farm all my life, you know, up to then, so I knew the guys... You know, the, you see the tractor in the morning, they just go like that to you. Like, you know, it's a sort of a signal yeah. of, not endearment, as I said, but just acknowledgement. But it made our cover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it did, didn't it? It's one of the most famous photographs of yeah. it, really. The trouble, and when I did it, I remember he, he was standing there many times as I came through, or sat where he was behind the guardrail. Sad, I had white gloves on too, but sadly, I think I did, Sadly, it didn't show as much unless somebody said, you look at his fingers. And so I saw him, and so I used to come through sort of doing that to him as I went <laughs> through. And of course, when you look at it, it's, it's unfortunately in, in, in rather a, it's hidden by the, the, the color of the paint behind, but it is definitely. And it was quite, because you know, there's a guy there and you have, again, it's an acknowledgement. You know, every time I came out of Terre Rouge, there was this particular journalist or photographer I knew, and he had the camera up there and I sort of, Normally you might wave, but in this I just went <laughs> like that, you know. So, uh, where were we before? Uh, you asked me about I think we were about to talk Steve, about, him, about him lying in the middle of the yeah, racetrack. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> which of course you give him the story away now. But um, <laughs> <laughs> can we cut that bit out? Um, yes, S- Steve wanted to be in all the action. And uh, it, you know, I guess it was in part of the, pre- of the film when they said, look, Steve, you know, this is getting a bit dangerous. We don't need David Piper had lost his leg or whatever. And I, I hadn't got burnt at that point, I don't think. But... Uh, but you know we want um, you know we need some really fast stuff and we I remember having seen Grand Prix which of course you know was mostly Formula Fords and stuff Formula yep. Three cars juniors I remember seeing it and thinking oh what a pity you know and I remember seeing them on the f- I was actually racing Formula Three at Monza when they were filming at Monza and I went to look at the cars and blimey I'm driving the same out there in my Formula Three race you know and there it was and uh, I, s- I remember when we started this film two years later I remember saying to whoever it was. We've really got to make this lifelike. We want to be fast. We've got to go fast. Fortunately, the drivers were good enough to handle the car. I mean, the people that drove them was Vic Elford, and there was, you know, Joe Siffert and Dickie Atwood, and no end of us that I could. Pun? Brian Redman. And Brian Redman. And loads of people that were good drivers and could handle drivers. And also, 
you need to go fast, and David Piper, bless him, but, and, but you need to go fast to keep your concentration. Because every time you go up and you go, stop, go back and do that again, take 16, you know, you come through, it get, get boring as heck if you went through off the pace. And thank goodness the cars we drove withstood it. I mean, nobody actually crashed apart from David. And that was, I suppose, one had to happen. But I mean, um, you know, we, we, so in this particular case anyway, Steve was dragged, Dwayne, you're gonna be the director today or that, you're in that area. And at the end of the, the, our run down at the Fort Chicane was John Sturgis, and then he would direct from there. So there was just Siffert and I, and I was in the Ferrari, and Joe was in the Porsche 917. And of course, he was driving for Steve in this case, and I was driving for Siegfried Rau, who was the Ferrari driver, German Ferrari driver. And um, so we were coming down, you come, you, come out of our, you come out of our Nage and go storming down. It's very, very fast. And you're probably doing 150, 160 miles, or maybe more, down through the cutting, which of course still exists as part of the road, but the Porsche curves are in there now, uh, which are still pretty done demanding. And you just come through this cutting down into the White House. And the White House, as you came down to it, was a house on the left. So as you came down, you were facing it, and you braked, and you turned right, and then you went around, turning left in front of the house. So it was a bit of right and then left. And, but the left was the major part. And as you came out of there, of course, you would drift out to the edge of the road. And o as over the years, or over three, four years, I don't know how long, but they had put a guardrail in. But the guardrail was back across the grass, maybe eight, six feet. And so as you came out, as time went on, the odd car would pop off the edge of the road and run up you know, two wheels or one le rear wheel on the dirt before electronics came in and ruined all that. And, you know, sort of just snake out a little bit. And by degrees, of course, every year they'd put a little bit more asphalt in that, you know, six or eight inch groove on the side. So the right hand side of the road with the white line, which had been down the middle, was now instead of being six foot wide, was nine foot wide on this side. So the white lines were actually not in the center of the total width of the asphalt. So we would be drifting out anyway. So this and then storm up to the port of chicane and then we'd slow down and so on. And we'd done this run three or four or five times. And every time we came through, because you couldn't see anything until there was the house on the left. And then you know, every time you suddenly, oh, there's a camera there, there's a camera there, a camera there, that sort of thing. And this one, ch and, and I say, Joe and I always drove flat out because he was always pushing me. A, he was a better driver than B, he was in a Porsche 917 and I was fighting this bloody Ferrari. And so I, was, I would go through pretty damn nearly flat out, but to give Joe a bit of a thrill. So we came storming through, and he was a wonderful driver, a very sort of uh, great character and personality driving. So we came storming through, and of course, uh, as I came through, I clipped the verge on the left and drifted across the line in the middle of the road out to the dirt and the asphalt on the outside. And then as I came through, I went, oh my goodness, there's a cameraman lying on the middle of the road on a white line. And, uh, and of course, that was fine. I carried on up the Ford Chicane. Meanwhile, Joe was right all over me. And when we, get, when we stop, Joe jumps out of the car. He's as white as, literally was as white as a sheet. His moustache was twitching. And he <laughs> leaps out. And of course, we had face masks like that around there. And he gets out. John Sturge says, so what's, what's, what's wrong? What's wrong then, Joe? What's the problem? And he says, he said, there's some stupid camera I'm lying in the middle of the road. He said, I, I didn't see him. And I was just pulling inside Derek to have a look. And I nearly ran over him, as you would pull out to have a look, make it better for the camera not realizing this one would be in the middle of the road. So uh, with that, Joe, you know, Joe said, we can't do this, it's too dangerous. So, so he, um, John Sturgis on, the, on his little radio phones up and he says, okay, Steve, would you come up here? So Steve turns up on his husky and drives up, stops and sort of casually lays, leans against it and says, what's up then? And so he said, well, and Joe says, it's crazy, Steve. There's some, some fat cameraman's lying on the middle, of the <laughs> white dotted line in the middle of the road. It's absolutely ridiculous. I nearly drove, drove over, to him, over him. And I didn't know what Steve literally said, but John Sturgis says, so who the heck did, you know, did you allow them, to, uh, this photographer, to go there? And he said, well, I, of course I allowed him to do it. So he said, but who was it? And Steve said, well, it was me. <laughs> and it was Steve that was lying on the white line holding the camera to get the shot he wanted. And he just trusted us enough that we wouldn't run over him or something. <laughs> I don't know, I, just, <laughs> I still don't make it out. I mean, it was sheer lunacy. But he got the shot he, I suppose, he wanted. The trouble is, it's a cop, you know, we came around the corner gone. So, I mean, it was, it was about three seconds of shot, I guess, which yeah. you, you still see in the movie. I haven't seen it for a while, so I've forgotten. But, you know, there were lots of things like that where even the one going down Mulzahn Strait, when we had a, f I was 
I was in the 917, in this case, overtaking a Ferrari being driven by, I'm not sure, because Joe wasn't there all the time. I was mainly. And I remember as I came up, I actually, I had, it was a, fr it was a Ferrari, I was in the Porsche. We had a frame out the side of the car, on, on the end of which was a camera. And it was a big, you know, as I said, they were, they were big cameras on the end. And of course, this thing out there, you know, with, a, with quite a big lens on it, but we measured it so that it actually, if, as I pulled along beside the Ferrari, and the Ferrari's in front of me, as I went along behind it, the center, this trip bar beside the lens, which you couldn't see, the trip bar would hit the bodywork at the back of the, of the Ferrari. And, and, and at that point, it would release a spring or a, a magnet, and the, and the bar would sort of, uh, which had been out here, would sort of s suddenly swing back in behind the, 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 uh, my, my Porsche. And, uh, and so, as I, sorry, it's from that position to that. And so as I went by, the, the camera would pick up the, the wheel and right. then the bodywork and the front wheel as I went by. And it, I mean, we had it really damn close. And the first, <laughs> first time we tried it, we came up. We, only, we weren't doing 180 <laughs> miles an hour, but we were moving on, obviously, because we all said we might, but we, we went on. Um, the first time I, I actually did it, unfortunately, the first time I tried to do it, as I went up the straight, the pressure of air on the, on the, on the lens actually tripped it because it was such a big pressure. And it came around, and as it came around, it went donk into position. The front of the Porsche went like that. I went, oh my God. And he went there, the front was up sort of off the ground. Not quite, but it did, I didn't realize how light. I knew it was light because I could feel it. But by the time it had gone from there and, and hit the back, it sort of almost put my nose in the Ferrari. Fortunately, it did it before I'd really caught the Ferrari up because it was just the air. So they had to strengthen up that make or break or whatever you call it and um, also put some weight in the front of the right up in the front of the 917 they took out the air box the air the, the radiator cover and then put um, some massive weights in there so it was a real dream to drive wow <laughs> and it worked the second night and when you see it on the actual film any of you that watched the film <laughs> after all these years I, I i went oh is that all it was so unimpressive because it's a cinemascope screen and it looks like I'm six foot away. But literally, we were sort of, I think, about eight inches away from the side of the Ferrari as I went past it. Yeah. And it worked. And the camera swung around. And you know, we carried on by. And you see the wheel. And then you see the front wheel. And that's it. So that all that work. But we got double the money. We got 200 quid dollars a day then. <laughs> I think Am so I right in thinking you got paid danger money as well if that's you were doing saying, yeah, well I got right. 200 yeah. for that yeah. instead of 100. <laughs> But it was fun. Oh, it was great fun. I mean, it was great to part. And, and for me, you know, I, it was 1970, so I had my thrill of Formula 2, Formula 1, which sadly didn't work out as well as I wanted. And there I was about getting into sports cars, but I was in this state of flux when I didn't know where I was going. Yet I was leading the F2 championship all over with everybody in the world in it, basically uh, up and coming people. Although I, I suppose I was over the hill by then because I'd been in it for two years. But I sort of come back into it. And uh, you know, I'd had my first Le Mans and, and so on. So I, 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 it was actually not a bad time for me, but I wasn't really earning much. Um, we weren't appalling money, at, we earned appalling money, but you didn't do it for the money, you did it for the love of driving wonderful cars. And then from there, you kind of, um, obviously when the 917 was outlawed, you then went into, you won Le Mans in between. Yes, with the Mirage development, yeah. And then you drove 934, 935, Kramer Porsches, yeah. and then of, you even drove a 908 three yeah, in 1980. Where? In 1980 as well, Dijon. That one. Oh, Dijon been. too. I drove at Valley Longa, and I think I won there. But that didn't, did that not show? It, uh, it did. Oh, it did. But it just cause the 908 in 1980 would have been a very old sort of car. Well, they're all the bloody old. <laughs> <laughs> and I was old too. I was 40, pretty much. But um, yeah, I was 42. I felt young. Gosh, I think how old I am today. Anyway. Um, yeah, I, I, I really remember very little about Dijon. And did I win it then? Uh, I don't no. think so. No, you were with Siggy Bruin. Pardon? You were driving with Siggy Bruin. Oh, right, yes. Um, but we'll skip over that and okay. go on to the but I, I think I won at Valley Longa. Cause I'm, and then I, I won at Brands Hatch too, in a John Webb race. And I remember he said to me, he said, could you slow down and make a race of it? <laughs> and I went, you know, nobody's ever s asked me to go slower. It's usually, <laughs> would you hurry up a bit because you're f lagging behind? And uh, I remember thinking, no, I'm going to, you know, it, uh, how do you go slower? I mean, I know you lift off, but what ha if you go slower and make a race of it, and then you get a puncture, or, so, you know, and you're going, well, bloody hell, if I could have kept ahead, I could have got a minute, 
had the puncture, gone in, changed tyres and come out and still been leading. I mean, yeah. all you want to do is le win the races. You're not give a damn about what, you know, what the fans think about it. Well, you know they're <laughs> going to enjoy seeing a 908 win or whoever wins, they're yeah. always keen. But for the driver to have to do, to do it, so I ignored what, sort of ignore what John asked me to do. And then you were back with Porsche with the work team, 936. Um, well, and the little GTR. Yeah, the, yeah, the that was the factory car. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The year before. Do you still have your, G your GTS? Yes, yes. I was out on it last night. Really? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. It's no, it, it, was it? It was last night. Yeah. Yeah. We did a, a Porsche thing in Portsmouth last night. No, it was. Um, it's still a great car. Yeah. It, it's still. F I took it out and drove. Justin, Sebastian, and I drove to Portsmouth and back last night. And it really does tramp on. It's the most amazing thing. You're accelerating. It's the only car I've ever driven that normally to go faster, you press the pe pedal down and, you, and a bit more and a bit more to go faster and faster. This thing, you get, take third throttle, third, you know, you get it up, you second gear, third gear, and then you push the throttle just a certain way uh, and it's accelerating really well. And then it sort of goes <laughs> and your foot hasn't moved, yet the thing is just rocketing. It's the only car I've ever driven up that has 70. that sensation. Pardon? Up to 70. Yes, uh, up to <laughs> 70. It was on the farm roads, actually. <laughs> but uh, that 1981 win, come back to that, was there any pressure? Uh, that was, yeah, 1981 win, well, it was, to yeah. me, was very, very important because I was about to retire in seven, you know, the year before. And uh, because I'd had a pretty good run, I wouldn't say I was at all satisfied with my career at all. And I didn't consider I'd done anything, you know, that good. I won Le Mans once and I'd, you know, won lots of Formula 2 races and Formula 3 and... But it wasn't, uh, you know, I didn't feel satisfied at all, but I couldn't carry on the way it was. And, uh, and then out of the blue, that's when Steve O'Rourke phoned me and said, would I drive with him uh, the whole season, initially in the Lancia? And I said, let's meet and talk about this. Because I don't think we should run a, a factory-entered, or what was a factory-entered Italian car. Because I don't think it's, you know, going to be any good when they get no assistance. I said, you run a BMW. I said, I know we can get help from BMW and they would, they, want, they would like to achieve something. So I said, we won't win anything, but we'll always be there. Yeah. So um, we were at the first race at Monza, and um, uh, I don't know, we qualified where we should have qualified, you know. And um, with Steve O'Rourke, I think David Hobbs was in that race. If not, he certainly was at Silverstone, the next one. And uh, while I was there, Valentin Schaefer comes up to me, who's the turbo man from Porsche, and he's, who I'd been with before. And he said, um, <coughs> So he said, so what are you driving, young And I said, I'm driving the, you know, the uh, M1. He said, oh, he said, what are you doing at Le Mans? So I'm driving the M1 because, you know, I've got a contract for the year. But in those days, Porsche just did one race a year, and that was Le Mans, which is great if you want to do one race a year and can go off and sell houses and property, and you're very wealthy. But uh, if you've got to sort of pay the bills, you can't just go off and yep. just do Le Mans. And the money isn't good enough to just do Le Mans anyway. Um, it's the fact you're winning it. And so I t anyway, so I said, oh, thank I'd love to do it, um, Valentine, but you know, I've got this contract for the year. So the next, that night at dinner, Steve O'Rourke says to me, who was a great friend of mine, became a super friend. He said, um, who was that you were chatting to? I told him, Valentine Schaefer, I told him the conversation. And he said, no, he said, if Porsche wanted you, I'd be flattered to think they wanted my driver. I went, wow. And I went to bed that night, the night before the race, lying in bed going, I'm gonna win Le Mans. I know I'm going to win the one. It's the most, only time I've ever sort of dreamt. Li no, I wasn't dreaming. I was like fantasizing about sure. the fact. It was just like premonition. I was going to win it. Anyway, that, but it's the only time and it stuck with me forever because I, I just knew. And the next day we had, a, I think something went wrong and Steve pulled off in the kitty litter or just stopped in it. I don't know there was a problem. And so on the Monday I phoned up um, Manfred Yanker and he said, oh, that is very good, Derek. Now I have the two best drivers in the world. You will drive with Jackie X." I went, whoa, <laughs> you know, I didn't know they rated me at all. There I'm, I thought I might drive the second car with somebody, but it'd be so that was very exciting. Then I thought, and I've got to sort this out with Steve, haven't I? <laughs> so <laughs> I went back to Steve, I went and met him in London. I came up to town and he, he, uh, and he, he, he said, let's, okay, let's talk about it. So we did and I, he said, no, I would be honored, I said, to, for you to drive for Porsche. So I did. And, um, you know, Jackie and I say we never lifted the bonnet. We'd never sat in the car till we got to Le Mans. And uh, it was just fantastic. Just cruise to finish. Yes. Yeah. Nearly. Yes, we did. We were, I read 15 laps in the lead or something. You mentioned um, Jackie Ix there. 
uh, I wanted to talk a bit about your partners and what makes yeah. great what makes a great t teammate really, um, and whether there was a quality which you see running through all of your sort of teammates over the years. No, I, 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 there wasn't really a quality because running through them, they were just totally different characters. Yeah. And I think I changed as a driver over the years. Um, I was always in awe of Jackie because he was like in Formula 2 when I was in Formula 3 and he won the Nürburgring German Grand Prix in a Formula 2 Tyrrell, a Matra. And I always held him in awe because he was just so amazingly quick, good, never seemed to get into trouble and just had something about him that, that read star all across his back, you know. And he should have been my book world champion, without a doubt, in Formula One, but he was in the wrong place, the wrong time, whatever. But I think what he did for me was that, um, I mean, he asked John Moir, could he drive with me at Le Mans? And he wants to drive with me, I can't believe this. And he, because I saw the letter he wrote to John Moir, and because uh, I never imagined he'd want to drive something like that. So that was the way it was, and you know, um, we, we, as I say, we never sat in the, uh, the Mirage. I don't think he even tested it until he came to Le Mans, but he might have done. It was very easy to drive, the Mirage. Um, but, you know, it was just special that he, you know, uh, the Mirage particularly, he wanted to drive. And then again, with the Jules car, um, he was then the driver. And I came out of the woodwork and was his teammate. And I think I just learnt, just, I don't know what I, I there's something in, you know, that sort of s subconsciously you pick up from people like that. You see the way their attitude, the way they go about it. There's no heroics, there's no shouting. There's no screaming and then whooping it up and that sort of thing. Ooh, what's this? You just got on with the job. And I would say we very rarely had to discuss what we were going to do through the whole of the time we raced together. I mean, obviously, we had a problem. We'd say, well, maybe we should do this or that. But I remember when, even with the Mirage, John Wire had a driver's briefing. And I think Howden Ganley was in the other car with maybe Vern Schuppen, but I honestly can't remember. We had like a driver's briefing, I think. And um, I think they might have, did they have three drivers in the other car? It doesn't matter. We had a driver's briefing of the team. So I, um, this is, remember, the first time I, I'd, had, I'd finished fourth the year before. And uh, literally I walked, Jackie and I walked in, he looked at us and with all the f other drivers there and he said, you two can go away, you know how to win. And I went, I've never won, how the hell do I know how to win? You know, I walked out a bit mystified. I wanted the real lecture on what to do and that sort of thing, which I'd read about in all the books. So that was it, and with Jackie, we just got on and did the job. And as people say, well, what did you say to each other? Well, we never talked, because he's getting out as I'm getting in. You know, pat on the back and <laughs> get out, I'm, you're in the way. So um, I, I, we never discussed anything until afterwards, and then we would, he was never one to show great emotion. I mean, I, w I don't know if I was really that excited either. At the end, it's such an anticlimax when you've won. You know, I mean, it isn't. You win, and it's like, oh my God. But you're so tired, and the, uh, there's two of us driving it, you know, f until 1984. Yeah. It was really, and I never thought about it as being tough because I always just understood there was two. And one year, I think it was 83, Jackie said, it's time we had another driver. And I said, but who? And he wrote me a letter, I remember that. I wish I'd kept all those things. Yeah. He wrote me a letter and said, I think it's time we had a, a third driver because I think it's getting very wearing. And I think he w that's so typical of him because he had analyzed that we were getting, the cars had more G-force and that sort of thing, it was getting more yeah. tiring. And he'd, he'd figured it out, whereas I never thought about it. I'd just gone and drive it, and I'd get more tired and more tired and more knackered, you know, and sweat more. Did you have the same relationship with Holbert? Uh, very much, yeah. But then, I guess, the opposite for Beloff. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> um, I, I, Stefan, I was put with him, really. I had an option of another driver and Stefan Beloff. And I said, no, I want to drive with Beloff, right. because I knew he was a very, very fast. I didn't, I'd never heard of him crashing particularly, and he wasn't really a crasher, but he had a couple in my time, which had tragically ended him in a nasty finish for him. But, I mean, he was just electrifyingly fast. Th and they basically put him with me because they thought that I would sort of calm him down a bit. Um, and so I, he, I'd call him son and he'd call me father. And, we ha and as I said again last night, I mean, if you ever see a picture of us, in nearly, nearly always we were laughing. Yeah. I mean, he was such a, a fun kid, he wasn't serious about it, he wasn't intense, you know, I mean, he, he just wanted to drive and drive very fast. But my big regret is that nobody got hold of him and said, hey, you know, calm down a bit, you're really a brilliant young driver, but you need to be controlled yeah. and graded almost up into being a top driver. Did you feel I you had that sort of relationship with him, that father and son relationship in, in reality? <laughs> I don't it? think so, no. <laughs> 
Um, but no, no, I don't think so. I mean, he didn't sort of say, you're right, lad, you know, none of that stuff. I mean, he was a man and he was bloody quick and a, he did a heck of a job. Yeah. But the only problem with all his wonderful driving was that he kept used too much fuel. <laughs> and I get in the bloody car for the second hour <laughs> and I'd sort of go off and of course for the first lap I could let it rip. And then they'd come on the radio and say, hey, Bell, turn the mixture down, turn the boost down, drop your revs from eight down to seven, six, and take it easy. Because Stefan, in all his electrifying laps, you know, had used a lot of fuel, which was great for the fans, but it wasn't much good for me because yeah. I, I droned around like an old fart, you know, so I go, oh, God, God, God. <laughs> thanks, Stefan, it was really good. But he, we had some great races, I mean, nonetheless, I mean, it wasn't as bad as that, but we had some quick races, and I, I don't think I let him down, I, you know, backed him up pretty well. Do you think there were signs where that he was kind of beginning, beginning to understand endurance racing a little bit more? Oh, most definitely, in the most so definitely. I just couldn't understand the moves that he appeared to make on Jackie at Spa, which were unnecessary. And I've only ever seen the in-car, uh, Jackie's in-car, and, and believe me, I sat there and watched it with two other drivers at Porsche and Jackie, and honestly, I'm not standing up for him in any way at all. He, st he just kept to his line the whole way. He, he, didn't, he didn't move across the road, he didn't do a center and dart across. He just sat there and braked down on the brake line and, to give the guy the chance, anybody who wants to, except for that one corner, which you never would look in your mirror to see if anybody was yeah. daring to be stupid enough, because literally you turned into that Eau Rouge flat. I mean, we took it eight times out of 10, we took it flat out. Really, even? Oh yes, oh yeah. You break on the way up or? No, you never break. Just lift? Or just, you'd just lift at the bottom, just to set it and off you'd go. And if you got halfway around, you do it at the bottom because there were no identification marks. There wasn't like a, a yellow mark in the road. I mean, you were in the middle of the track coming down past the pits, a little bit to the right, but you, there was nothing because the pit entrance yep. exit came out and you were left with another 20 feet of asphalt, which you left because you weren't going to go out there. So you came across to the pit, ex pit exit and at a certain point, whichever was your judgment, you turned left, went across, picked the left exit, apex or right apex and you drifted out to the outside. If it didn't quite work, you'd just feather, just a <laughs> back on and that was enough, but there's enough to slow you down. Yeah. But you could hear the cars and how many went through flat and you couldn't do it every lap. It was uncanny. It was just an amazing thing. Wow. It's the most tricky corner in the world, that, without a doubt. Harder than Burnerville and... Yeah, Burnerville's was easy. Basically, it was it's only just, one it was way. Just a, it was just a you just go round it, don't you? It's, I mean, it's bloody fast entrance, but I mean, if the car's good, you can do it quicker, and if it isn't good, you're in a me you know, you don't. You're sort of battling yourself. Yeah, that's right. But I mean, that t you have to, you, ha you ha I mean, au rouge, you have to be on the right si on the right side of the track, which of course has changed a lit quite a lot now. You had to be on the right side, but not against the guardrail. You so you were ten foot out because you'd be, you know, you'd be going almost across. You'd be going like that to go in, which is crazy. But you'd be going out there, and at a certain point, you'd do that to pick up the apex straight onto that one and up over the top and then clicking the left and then clicking the right as you went out. I mean, the, all those you had to get right. And if you didn't get it right from the beginning, then there was nothing to tell you were right, apart from a gut feeling, I ain't getting around here. <laughs> so then, um, win three came, as with the 956, yes. Le Mans. Yes. How different was that to the 962? Because that's a question from uh, Jamie Smith has asked as well. Um, it, again, it's, it's strange, you know, we all went testing that Mirage, we went testing the 956, Jock and me and Jackie went testing at the beginning of that year in, in January 1983, right? Three, yeah. Two, 1982, first year. Wasn't yes, it? sorry. And, uh, and we all went testing, but we'd never driven the, I had never driven the 936 there. So all I had was my experience the year before in the 936. So when we went with the 956, I couldn't say, wow, I was qu much quicker around that corner. It was like, wow, this is quick. The last thing I'd been there was, was the GTR, the 924. And I spent hours testing there. But it just, it, it, you, you obviously, you, it's, the thing is about ground effect, you don't have anything violent about it. It just goes around quicker than a conventional car. There's no change, it's just that it's got more grip. Um, it do doesn't do anything. I mean, it breaks away a bit sharper if it does, because it's, you know, it does one of those. But really, the car was very stable. And so I, I, I must admit, I've talked to Jackie about it the other week, actually, uh, when we were at Monaco. And I, I said, do you remember? I said, 
because he's not good at remembering. He doesn't, he doesn't want to remember, actually, but um, the past. But um, I, I think we, he, he just, there was no great reaction from any of us apart than, my goodness, it's quick. And they were all trying to go quicker than each other, as you would, just to show you the best. And that was it, to be honest. Yeah, and then you got the 962, which came al along, but you know that that was different again. And it wasn't just the fact that uh, we had the you know the, the the wheelbase was a little longer. It wasn't just that. When they came along, they had different tunnels on it, and then inevitably we ended up with taller wheels and narrower wheels to get more tunnels. Yeah. And then we went up from 2.6 liter engine to a 2.8 to a 3 liter to 3.2. So, or, you know, and bigger turbos and whatever else you want to throw at it. So every time we went out, it was quite dramatic. And of course, we went PDK and all these other things they wanted to test. Yeah. Well, I'm running out of time, I'm afraid. We'll have oh, to we really? Rattle through Am I talking that much? Rattle through some more questions, yeah. I'm afraid. Before we, I just wanted to ask about the, the downforce and the increased speeds. Would it, would it take out of you physically more uh, well, uh, I think as your career progressed as the cars? I would say I would say probably yes. Um, I mean, I was led on a after that '83 race that Jackie and I came from, lost a lap on the first lap when he got punted off. Um, we drove through, and I got back in the lead at 6:15 in the morning, and then the engine stopped. So there's me as not a chief mechanic, but the only mechanic available, and I had to change the sensor on the flywheel, I had to change the the distributor cap or something else, and I had to change the Sorry, the co I changed the, the coil and the sensor on the flywheel and changed the ECU. And you did all those things and it started, so I guess I achieved something. But it wasn't easy, you know, to, at six o'clock in the morning doing anything. Um, but I mean, that, that was pretty tough on both of us, I think. And then we struggled through it all the time, remember? We made a lap up in that 14 hours, which you say, really, is that all? But we didn't use any more fuel than the others because we were on the same number of laps. Yeah. So we overtook everybody but this and had a, you know, on the same fuel. And um, we sound, it doesn't sound much when you say you were eight miles behind and then you made it all up. It's quite a long way at Le Mans. And um, they go into Mulsan and then it stops again. So I had to do that number on it, got it back to the pits and then Jackie took over and then I think around about 11 o'clock something like that, I was, used, to lose level, used to use lose time you know, what time it was later in the race, um, because you didn't sleep really. And um, I remember we then had an oil cooler split and they had to change the whole oil cooler, uh, which took time. It wasn't just a, you know, one part or a line, it was the whole bloody thing. And, uh, and then we got going again and we were still, ch you know, around a lap or a lap and a half behind until then we had no brakes and they wanted to change the discs and Jackie wanted the disc change and I said, no, leave it. The options to go slower, I said, I'll go slower and didn't. But you know, we made it work, and I think I got the fastest lap of the race in the last hour. Seventeen so seconds. Pardon? Seventeen seconds. Was the it? Gap was it? Up between you and Holbert. Yeah, I know it's amazing. Did you think you were going to win it? Oh yes. Uh, I, if it had been another lap, yes, because they had such a problem. Yeah. I mean, you know, and ours was running like a dream. I mean, such like a dream, you couldn't stop it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was running perfectly in every mechanical sense, except for the brakes weren't good. But to be honest, I used the brakes like hell. Had to, didn't you? Doing 235, you've got to use something to slow down. But we you probably use the transmission a bit more than normal, because right. uh, we had to take the risk with it. But I just kept thinking that every time I went down Mulsan straight, that you know, if I got heated the brake discs up with my left foot, so you that that they might, as I, so I was ped, put my left foot across, yeah. but not obviously wanting to lose time, but I, or you know, pushing too hard, but putting some heat into the discs, being really a top engineer here, that the discs would sort of glue together, you know, the, so they would expand. Because yep. when things get hot, they expand. And I hoped, rather than shut bits out, that they might just gel that, that bit of heat might just hold, rightly or wrongly, and no engineer's ever said, well, you're clever, Derek. <laughs> but they haven't said I was a prat either. So they just look and go, really? <laughs> so we'll move on to 88. Yes. I think I've spoken to you about this before, Ludwig. Oh, God, my car downstairs, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, you? that was so unfortunate. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, everybody says we'd have won the race. I think we would. We should have been lovely to have won it that year. Um, but Klaus, I mean, I saw Klaus last year. I hadn't seen him for five years, you know, and he's, he's, he's got a little bit chubbier than he was. He looked very fit. 
And he, every time he, see, he saw me, he said, I'm still regretting that I did that day. I'm so sorry. But you know, that's life. We yeah. make mistakes. I'm just glad I never made a cock up like that yeah. when I was that I did that I'm aware of. He just must feel terrible because we both said, just keep him out of the bloody car. We'll drive the rest <laughs> of the race without him, you know. But uh, it was a great, great pity because I mean, we were. At, it was a tough race with Jaguars yeah. and everything out there, and and we just lost. We just didn't quite make it. But then the year before, you'd won Le Mans and lost your drive in the same sort of. Two hours before the race finished, you've been told that Porsche was pulling out of... Pulling out of racing, yes. Yes. What was that like? To well, being told at that point? Two hours before the finish, well, we to take I, a fifth win. I just put my head around. I mean, we actually knew they were going to pull out. At some, they had to at yeah. some point. And, um, you know, I was very disappointed. I, uh, but, you know, what can you say? You just get on and drive it. You're, you're there to win the race. Yep. And the emotions don't come into it. I didn't drive around going, oh, this is the last <laughs> time. It, it, last. it almost wasn't. But, you know... Yeah. But it was because we still drove the Yurst car in 93, didn't we? Yes. And yeah. uh, related to that, Jamie Smith has asked if you ever got to drive a Porsche engined Indy car. Because obviously they were no. leaving to. No, uh, no, they never got us near that. Okay, that's I, it. Yeah, they must have done it here, I suppose. But you know, they had some good. I don't know, I don't think Jackie ever drove it or Stuckey or anybody like that. No. It was purely the Americans that got in the Indy car. Right. And the Formula One, I have no idea because it was run, was it the was it Arrows for the one? What was it the Porsche? Then they ran it, was it? Uh, it was, that was after McLaren, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. Yes. Anyway, so no. Not too sure. No. Okay. So uh, to finish, this one might like, take a bit longer to decide, I think, because we've got two quick questions to finish. Yeah. Uh, Piers Ruthven has asked, one car, one lap, one circuit, what would it be? If you could pick one lap, one car to do one lap, what, and uh, what circuit would you do it? And you mean? Um, I guess it would have to be a Porsche. Yep, it would have to be a book. Porsche. Because yeah. <laughs> off the record, I would say a 333 SP Ferrari. Right. Because <laughs> it, it was a Formula One car. Um, now, I think, I think the, f the quickest Porsche I ever drove was the, what, right at the very end. And I know we went testing at Bruno um, the year in 1994, that, which was going to be the last race I did for Porsche. It was. Porsche and the car when I it was beginning of flat bottoms and um, and um, I remember we it didn't work at Le, at Le Mans test weekend the whole lot was vibrating and bumping and that was it so so uh, I was really upset about it yeah so we so we went to um, Le Mans for the test weekend and it was a disaster but it wasn't a factory team it was Kramer and then we went away and tested at Bruno and they offered me a sort of an interseri Porsche 962 it was an open cockpit car, and it sort of the body was, it was fully enveloping almost, except for no roof. And that was the most amazing car I ever drove. It had so much power, and of course it didn't have everything duplicated. It just literally had one, one of this, one of that twin turbo, but everything was made lighter and lighter, and that was astounding, absolutely unbelievable. And which circle would you take it to, Watkins Glen? I, oh, 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 well, no, I'd, I'd take it probably to Spa. Old Spa or? Old, well, no, the present Spa, I think. And related to that, Jacob said, Jacob's asked, one car, one circuit, 24 hours, and two teammates, who would they be? Um, that's really difficult, but I, I, um, but see, I only ever drove with two teammates, which was Stuck and Holbert, and they were a wonderful pairing, you know, to have the three of us, I think. Yep. I think those two were the best pair. So you wouldn't mix Holbert and Hicks? I, I would do very easily, yes. And I would mix Stuck and all three, all that group I would have in a car, yes. So you make a good foursome. <laughs> and that would be in a 956? No, 962. 962. So you could take two 962s. Pardon? You could take two 962s, have Al Holbert in one and with Jackie X. Oh, I see. And you could just do two stints, I guess. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That'd be ideal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and this book is out now? It came last it's week, yeah. It's available now for people to buy? Yeah, absolutely. So I believe. Okay. I mean, it uh, must be. Yes. I know journalists have got it various journalists and there's a stack sitting there there's a stack the other night so I'm sure but I haven't got one yet <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I think you can buy it on our shop as well I believe oh right um, so oh, good. if you need a copy visit our shop um, okay. it's well worth a read um, as hopefully this podcast showed okay. so thanks for joining us no my pleasure um, thank you Joe thank you Joe thank you uh, Alan we'll be back soon for the next talk show uh, we have a very good guest lined up um, so that should be not too long to wait so we'll uh, see you then